friends when everybody knows exactly where they're supposed to be at all times. At Adam's Friendship, we've had wonderful success because in the 131, kids know exactly where they're supposed to be. We'll start off very quickly showing you how we number it to keep it simple for practice and games. The number one is usually our best athlete, usually taller, long arms, because we want him in a, in a position to be able to cover the whole floor. Our two and three are the wings. Two is on ball side. He's usually smaller, quicker, loves to pressure the ball. Our weak side wing is usually bigger, more teams shoot from the right, and he's a better rebounder. Our five is our strongest player, always plays between ball and basket. We need some, some strength in there. They've been at, at Adams 5'11 all the way to 6'5 or 6'4. Doesn't make any difference, needs a big heart. Four is our baseline runner. And it's exactly what it is. The baseline runner does just that. Sprints corner to corner. Okay? Now, a lot of coaches love man-to-man. -man. It stands for the entire defensive possession. So if, in fact, we're looking out there and everybody's in a stance but one, a sub, uh, a sub will shortly be in the basketball game. So number one rule, always stay in a stance. All right, throw the ball around a couple times. Let's just see if we stay in that stance. All right, good enough. Now, that's rule one. That's demanded. And in fact, sir. So if this guard, Nick, looks at the corner, we're reading his eyes like any good defensive back would do. And maybe the low post Aaron is sliding outside looking to deflect, but he's watching his eyes. So if Nick throws it to the corner, we're on the way. Here you go. Throw it here. If he's out a little bit and they throw it low, he may look open. But because we're looking to move or reading the eyes, we're going to be moving, rule number three, when the ball's in the air. So read eyes, read eyes, move when the ball's in the air. One, two, three. All right, just move it around. The... All right, nice job. At Adam's Friendship, we never rest on defense, ever. And making the state five times in a decade to a Final Four is the biggest reason for that. We don't rest on defense. If we're going to rest, it's going to be on the other end of the floor. We've got our first three rules. Our fourth rule is look to deflect. So if, for example, the number four, we, let's say we have high pressure right now. The four is reading his eyes. If he sees a pass, even to the outside, throw it, he's on his way, he's looking to deflect. Coaching point. I would like him to turn his thumb down, as he did, so that he can control it and tip it. Very often at Adam's Friendship, the person who deflects the ball is not the one who steals it. The person who deflects it, often not. So if everybody is eyeing the basketball and watching eyes, if there's a deflection, we expect to pick it up. Okay? So let's just move it around the horn a little bit and see if we could get a deflection by reading eyes. All right, we got one right away. All right, throw it back out. Review. Stay in a stance. Read eyes, moving the balls in the air, look to deflect. Now, when you see the film later, when I have clips, I'm giving you everything I have. I am not hiding anything. I'm sharing all that we do. I, uh, there's a brotherhood in coaching where I think we can become better as an entire basketball program here and everywhere if we teach the game of basketball and don't just coach it. So there'll be coaching points, teaching points, don't coach the 131, teach it. All the little things. For example, if Nick has the ball and we want high ball, and he just, well, let's say he passes it to corner. We want high ball pressure. Teach it. Teach it. We want high pressure. And in fact, we'll teach this. We want the ball to be mirrored. So if it goes here and it gets there, Tim doesn't deflect it. If he's in a position to drive, now he mirrors the ball when he starts to drive. If he goes left, he's going to mirror it with both hands that way. 
so that in fact the ball is always being pressured. The fifth coaching point, the fifth team defensive point is that everyone goes to the boards mad. So when the ball is shot, everybody knows exactly where they're supposed to be. Now the one thing that I've thought about a lot as I've ended my nearing the end of my coaching career is should you block out on every shot? Do people do it? Well, quite frankly, if the ball were shot here, and we'll shoot it in a second, move in a little, Nick, Tim would block him out. The wing would block him out. Most likely, let's say you're down a little bit, Nick, Billy would be able to block out the five who he's with. Now, when Aaron goes down, he probably won't be able to block all the time if they send two, but he could. Okay? So we can have blockouts. If that's a crucial thing in your plan, then you block out. However, our number one never, ever blocks out. He learns to find caroms. He goes to the weak side board. It's something that we've discovered over the years. We play great defense, and then all of a sudden they'd miss it and they'd get the rebound. Now our leading rebounder is our number one, and often our one is taller than our five. He leads us. Now, right now, we're in what's called 13. 13 would allow the one and the five to be somewhat back, protecting the basket. The wings would be tending to be off of the free throw line and ready to explode if necessary. All right, let me show you the basic slides out of 13. All right, if the ball comes across court, it's started by our number two. He would simply have to call ball, and we know where we're supposed to be. So the one would have great ball pressure, all right? If he's wide and we're in 13, he might not be out. If we move into 23, which we'll discuss, then he would keep moving out and pressure higher. Or we might even call it 13 extended. All right, so like right now we're in 13. The baseline runner, the number four, is a step off of the baseline, ready to explode to corner. The wings on each side are ready to be pistons. I don't know any other way to say it. The four is ready to run out. The five has one rule. He stays between ball and basket at all times. He never varies that rule. If, for example, he thought he had to help out on a bigger player here and move up here, that would create, unfortunately, the angles. You can stay out, Dusty, that we don't want. So the five rule always stay between ball and basket. The one's rule is to stop ball reversal if he can. not In fact, he's sometimes in a position where he's in a false trap. He may be slid over to the lane line. If we're in 13, he doesn't usually go outside the lane lines. Okay? But he makes this pass hard. If the ball is passed, then the, two, the three becomes exactly like the two, and the two goes down in a piston, and now we're on this side. Now, here's one of the key teaching points. If we're playing good defense, we're always going to have four people ball side. The five and the one, the four and the wing are always going to be ball side. Now, there will be little adjustments made by players on the floor. For example, it appears to me right now that Aaron is sliding a little bit to the outside. It looks like he wants to deflect this pass. And if Steve threw a pass, go ahead, he might be able to take that. However, if, in fact, he's not the, the better player is inside, then he would make sure he's between ball and basket himself. This is the man-to-man -man fundamental. He's taking him between ball and basket, man-to-man. -man. Billy's between. These guys, are all the rest are looking for deflections. Okay? Now the four, throw the ball to the corner, puts pressure in the corner. Here's a rule for, here's a slide for Aaron. He actually comes up and tries to make ball reversal difficult. This is a man principle. If you can get the ball on one side and keep it there, you're going to be far more successful. So the rule in the base is for Aaron to, or the wing, to make ball reversal difficult. Okay, throw it out front. Now, Jared is going to make ball reversal tough. Billy will take away high post, and Dustin will be inside, a step further inside, making sure they can't lob it there. So the lob's over here. Every time there's a lob, it allows us to set our defense a whole lot more quickly. And if we're in the stance, that takes care of it.
Okay, let's just move the ball and see if there's some slides that we can talk about. All right, go. Start reading eyes. Read eyes. Read eyes. All right, teaching point. Let's say that the corner throws it all the way to that corner. Okay, now we already said that the four must always sprint. That's what he does. He sprints corner to corner. He doesn't stop. But there's no way he could have got there in time. So the wing, high pressures on his upper hip. <clears throat> if he starts to drive, the four is still coming, and we could have a natural trap, or Aaron could slide off of that, and we're back into the same situation. There's never been a better team defense, a better helping defense in this situation. The five would be dead fronting, unless we're in one of our... Uh, optional changes okay now another teaching point the quicker the wing is the further he can stay there one the further he can slide outside so take a step this way Tim. if he's if we've got great ball pressure high hand pressure mirroring the ball we've got the low post fronted and Jared's in a position the one where he's reading eyes I doubt if he could pass in and pass it in here I doubt very much whether he could get it there if he's reading and we're doing this repetitively over and over and over. So if we've got a pretty tough situation ball side and he's reading eyes, the wing, Tim is, he may slide up, he may skip the ball, and it may go right into Tim for a layup. I'm convinced that in basketball you need to get some easy baskets. Obviously offensive rebounds are easy baskets. But steals and layups or as easy or more so. So what we're looking for is an aggressive pressuring defense that has great team help. And you can see that if the ball went here, if it were skipped to that corner, Aaron would help for a second on the high side, Buchanan would keep coming. Now if in fact Aaron were there and the guy made a great fake and passed it back here and this was a great player, we could easily help here for a second. Aaron explode up on him. Jared drop back, can help on the inside and take care of the outside. Okay, that's our base 13. Let's do it and let's have a few teaching points as we go along. Okay, nice. Now, teaching point. We're looking to deflect it. Believe it or not, we also call block shot a deflection. And as much as we hate to block a shot with the guy who's guarding it, if Billy had high hand pressure and he was, and we don't want to bump him, we, we want to be strong, if this was an All-American, as he is, if he would slide in and come back, we never give up, we're getting to the depth of the ball, if he goes up for a shot, Aaron is actually looking not even with the whole hand. Here's a teaching point. Touch it with one finger. Just deflect it with one finger. And now all of a sudden, we've got deflections. These kinds of things win basketball games. And in fact, when our wings intercept and we get deflections, that's the time we really want to go with the ball, okay, and get the easy baskets. All right, let's see if we have some more teaching points. All right, hold up. Five's dead in between. We've got extra people. Uh, this is a, a now a, a coach of mine. Why would we want seven people on the floor, Jared? It's a lot harder. It makes it harder than a game. Way harder than a basketball game. Now, if they're just throwing it around, it is not. But let's go through a few coaching points. Go. All right. Teaching point. Great job. Great job. Uh, they're trying very hard. They're getting excited about it. In a basketball game, every now and then, 